guess I should start. Let's do half a step up, half step up. Half step up. Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane, where our mission is to join together to create a nourishing, liberal religious home and to champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in our wider world, or as we say in short, to create community, find meaning, and work for justice. Welcome to one and all. I want to begin by embracing, as always, all that you bring with you to this space all of your unique beliefs, background, lifestyle, experiences, all that helps make you who you are is welcome here this morning. This of course includes those who hear me say this each Sunday as well as those who might be joining us for the first time this morning. You're equally as welcome and appreciated and of course it is also true of those of you who are streaming live with us this morning. So welcome to one and all. Great to have all of you with us. I wanted to begin this morning by noting that our unity candle is lit at the front of our church. This is something we do when one of our members has passed away during the week. And this week, uh, our cherished member, Marion Moose, passed away uh, after having some uh, increasing health issues. That was on Tuesday. There's been no services set yet, but I'll certainly keep you uh, informed when that happens. But I would like to begin. Marion was a, not only a very important part of this congregation, but also a very important part of our community. So if, uh, and actually our country, <laughs> she has an amazing history. So uh, let's take just a moment of silence, if you will, in Marion's honor. Thank you. And again, I will keep you apprised of any service plans as they develop. I did also want to remind you that uh, next Sunday after our second service, we will be having our annual meeting in which we will uh, hopefully pass our budget for the coming year as well as elect uh, some new officers to our board and make some potential bylaw changes. So we'd love to have a quorum here so that we can make that happen. So I would ask everyone who uh, is a voting member of the congregation to please be here for that. And then finally, uh, our book sale is still going on. We're going to take a little hiatus from that for the summer. So one last chance to rummage through the, the books today. And those that we don't sell, we're going to donate to uh, uh, the prison system so that folks there can have something additional to read. And before we greet one another, I'm going to ask my friend Isabel Call to come forward to uh, help you learn just a little bit more about some of the technology that we offer here at, for you to use for your convenience, hopefully, at the UU Church of Spokane for what uh, she has aptly named her Tech Tidbit.
So how many of you all have watched a service online? That is pretty good. Everybody look around at those hands. These are people you can ask for advice for how to do it. Um, so this is our web page. You get to it. It's uuspokane.org. And on the front page, there's a place that says Watch Services down there on the right. Um, and you can also get to it on the menu along the top, Watch Services. So when you click the Watch Services button, you get to here, and this is actually a slide from a few days ago. If we were doing this live, you would see us streaming us, streaming us, streaming us, streaming us. But I didn't want to go there. Um, but so this is what you'll see. And if you log in on a Sunday morning, you can just watch live. Um, if you'd like to see a previous service, that's possible too. You can click on the right there. Um, you can also go back to the web page, and there's a past services archive link. So if you click our service archive, when you click that, you get here to this uh, menu, and you can click the past worship services. Um, also, this menu has orders of service archives and um, the weekly focus. If you want to see what this was last week, you can find it there. So if you click the past worship services, um, here's a list of all of the worship services. And if you click on the one that you want to watch, you'll get to a new page. Um, so here's an example. Um, you can click the title of the sermon, and it'll take you to the video. And um, if it's been a little while and we've had a chance to update, put up our sermon text, you'll see the sermon text there if you want to read it. All right. Now, one last tech tidbit. Um, also on the web, the front page here, there's a four members section. And when you go into that, you'll see reports, policies, and covenants. Um, and when you click on that, this is kind of our basic bread and butter documents, how the church runs. So if you want to do some homework before the annual meeting next week, um, that would be a great spot. The bylaws are up there. Um, so here's a list of them. The new social media policy is up there, so that kind of thing. Um, so I hope this is useful. Thank you, thank you. And um, please now take a moment to greet the people around you, especially somebody you don't know well.
Thank you, and as always, there will be more opportunity to visit with one another during our social hour immediately following the service, so please do stay around for that. Let's move forward now by lighting our chalice, the symbol of our faith, the symbol of our unity and our solidarity, of our openness and our inclusion, of our community and our individual uniqueness. May this small flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need. And may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth has been lost and cast a healthy shadow of doubt wherever it's been found. For four years, pediatrician Dr. Bill Green and I offered a course to first-year medical students called Take Two Poems and Call Me in the Morning. This was a class in medical humanities and reflective writing. We used short stories and poetry to generate thoughtful and creative responses in the students. Our main focus was to help them to develop tools for self-care, to increase empathy, and to prevent burnout. The following is a poem that I wrote in response to Raphael Campo's poem, Health, which imagines a different kind of health care. Incurable Joy. First, kindness clinics popped up on every corner. Inside each one, kindness spread like a virus, infecting all with, within smiling radius. Painless vaccinations against snarkiness and sarcasm were available for free to the teenagers, with booster shots available to the older, more jaded. Those who offered their arms without fuss received band-aids and two ounces of dark chocolate. <laughs> Prescriptions for gardening, dog walking, and balloon bouquet giving were ushered in as standard maintenance. Whole therapeutic practices developed around dancing, painting, and poem making. Instead of insurance claims, the only paperwork involved tickets to art galleries, comedy shows, and sing-alongs. Library cards allowed 24-hour browsing among stacks of books ceilings, ceiling high. Chicken soup for the soul kitchens became more popular than any fast food restaurant, and people lingered around tables laughing and conversing in comfortable chairs. Then, hospitals became havens for families working out issues of anger, addiction, and violence, resorting to the resort-like atmosphere cultivated for curing, soft lighting, lots of windows with garden views, humble and wise staff, and quiet rooms where true sleep was not disturbed by sudden poking or prodding. Everyone had a voice in their own care, and the time was taken to really listen to one another. Patients referred to the qualities of staff, not the status of the person. Doctors whistled and nurses hummed, music being medicine for the soul. Joyfulness was infectious, and the condition terminal. Please rise in body or spirit to sing, Oh, what a piece of work are we, number 313. Not tech tidbit. 
So this is the time for all ages, and I invite all the young and the young at heart, if you want to come sit up here. And I'm going to tell a story called The Story of Soil, which comes to me from another uh, ministry student, Arielle Aronson Eves, who's telling the story right now in Coeur d'Alene. It's a Unitarian Universalist there. So can anybody tell me what is soil? Yeah. Healthy dirt for the plants. Yeah. Anybody else? Any other definitions of soil? Yeah. Water? Yeah, it definitely has some water in it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it can be a verb. You can ruin something by soiling it. Yeah. Moisturized dirt. Yeah. Good. These are great definitions. Thank you. So the dictionary defines soil as the upper layer of earth in which plants grow, or a black or dark brown material, typically consisting of a mixture of organic remains, clay, and rock particles. But I like to think of soil as a community. There are three main mineral components of soil, clay, sand, and silt. And silt, I had to look this one up, it's basically like a mix between clay and sand. Um, in addition, there is ideally a little bit of organic matter. Um, do you have something to say? Okay, so you do, you do a flower thing where you're the stem and the flower and you've got the roots connecting down into the soil. Yeah, yeah thank you. And water. water, yeah. Cool, thank you. <laughs> so one of the main things in soil is the broken down organic matter. So after the flower, does its flower thing, it dies and it breaks down and it goes into the soil and it becomes a really important part there. And now, when the organic matter, when that flower is really, really broken down, so it can't be broken down anymore, it's called humus. And humus is a word that sounds a lot like the word human, and they're actually related, which tells me that the creators of our language thought that we humans have a lot in common with good, healthy dirt. In addition to minerals and organic matter in soil, there are also microorganisms. In one cup of soil, there are 100 billion microorganisms. These microorganisms are tiny, tiny little life forms like bacteria and fungi. And these microbes, together with the roots of the plants, make up the community of the soil. Just like we humans need to get certain nutrients from our food to be healthy, so too do plants. Luckily, they've developed a system of exchange with the soil microbes. The microbes are able to break down minerals in rocks. Now, Think of that, these tiny creatures are breaking rocks up into minerals, and they give these mineral nutrients to the plants, and in exchange, the plants feed the soil sugar. All this is happening under where our feet walk. Now, this is what happens in healthy soils. This system of cooperation breaks down when the plants stop needing the microbes. Now, why would plants stop needing microbes? Mm -hmm. Okay, because they're dying. Yeah? Okay.
Okay, so they're at the end of their life cycle and they're dying down and they don't need new food. Another reason is that they could be getting chemical fertilizer instead of microbes from the soil. So if we apply a lot of chemical fertilizers, the plants can get addicted to that quick fix and they are freed from the slow process of relationship building, of having to share with the soil. If the plants are annuals, then they'll be gone next year, and the community system will have broken down. So the next year's crop will have to have fertilizer in order to do well, because the relationship between the plants and the soil has suffered. It will take years to restore. But this kind of degradation is preventable, and restoration is possible. So we can bring back the health of our soil with a lot of care and learning to see crops not simply as things we take out of the land, but as part of a valuable community. And all that starts with the soil. Learning to see soil as more than just dirt, but healthy dirt. You might even call it sacred. So that's the end of the story. And how about all you kids gather around and I'm going to light this candle with rabbit. Come on, come on up. We light the second chalice so that as our children and youth go to their chapel, chapels that carry the light of our flame with them. May it illuminate, inspire, and warm you as it does us. We now gratefully give and receive this morning's offering which sustains this commu community and its mission in the larger world. Thank you, Michalina. We'll now kindle our candles of care for those who are most on our hearts and minds this morning. And begin with a candle for Jim Meredith, the son-in-law of Bernie and Al Toutant, who is recovering from a stroke. 
We do want to uh, light a candle of congratulations to our church member Claire Matlin and her husband Daryl, and now big brother Lincoln, on the birth of Gardner Lawrence Matlin, who was born on the 23rd. So congrats to them, and welcome to Gardner. And then congrats also to Bree Gardner, who is having a bridge ceremony in Bellingham today. Let's take a moment of silence on behalf of others that you might be thinking of, and as always, you'd be welcome to name them aloud at this time, if you'd like. Those named aloud and those embraced in our silence and all those who are suffering in our world at this hour, we hold in our community with compassion. I invite you now to settle in and find a receptive posture for our time of meditation. Please take some deep breaths and let the words followed by silence bring you into the spaciousness of contemplation. There is the old saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Picture an apple before you. If you cut it open at its equator around its middle and open it up, you will find a five-pointed star in each half. I think of this as a reminder that we are all made of star stuff. I'm sure uh, many of you know that I really enjoy learning about modern technologies and science and it informs a lot of my, my ministry and what I often have to share with you. And, and uh, I, I've been very fortunate in uh, the past year or so to be able to uh, study that more intensely than I ever have before. But my interest in it really started uh, way back in early in my theological training when I came upon uh, mystics who recognized that humanity and all of life really seems to be moving towards a convergence of, of unity that uh, rather than calling it the singularity as, as uh, scientist Ray Kurzweil does, uh, Pierre Tillyard de Chardin called it the omega point. And, this is a series of writings that he did in the 1930s and 40s before there was, were any com home computers or even the thought of having much of the technology we have today. But uh, quite a remarkable, remarkable visionary 
and this is a collection on the future of our species. But this is just a couple paragraphs. As I have also shown, two attitudes are possible in this situation, two forms of existentialism. We can reject and resist the tide, seeking by every means to slow it down and even to escape individually at the risk of perishing in stoical isolation from what looks like a rush into the abyss. Or we can yield to it and actively contribute to what we accept as a liberating and life-giving movement. It remains for me to demonstrate the urgency of the problem. That is to say, to fulfill my purpose by showing that we have truly reached the parting of the ways, the point where the waters divide, and also to show that in this momentous hour we cannot continue physically to exist to act without deciding here and now which of the two attitudes we shall adopt, that of defiance or that of faith in the unification of humankind. Thank you so much, Michalina, and we are doubly honored not only to hear you play that piece, but I understand you are also its composer. Wow, beautiful, thank you. Wow. So there's an old saying I'm sure you've heard, nothing is certain but death and taxes. Although there is an entire political party out there that doesn't seem to believe in the latter. <laughs> what may surprise you, however, is there's also a growing number of scientists who no longer accept the inevitability of death. This may sound strange, given that nobody has ever lived much past 100 years, and most not that long. So how can anyone seriously think that death is not inevitable? 
Our anthropocentric view of life can partly be to blame for such certainty. All humans ever to have lived have died, which is a pretty sound reason to conclude all humans are mortal, an inference that famously led Aristotle to explain the death of Socrates. Now, you don't find that funny, but I do, because I'm a philosopher, and I, I just think it's hysterical. But <laughs> I knew it was going to fall flat on its face with you, but I, I had to put it in there. I won't explain it, though. I was hoping Shane, is Shane here today? I don't see, Shane's a philosophy professor at Gonzaga, so I was thinking I'd like to hear one really odd chuckle out of the middle of the <laughs> service here, but anyway, forget it, I'll let it go. <clears throat> so we all, we all obviously logically can conclude that everybody's going to die, but, or every human being. But is it true that all living beings must die? That death is also inevitable for all of life? Well, we know that there are species of flatworm, jellyfish, lobsters, turtles, and other creatures that are not biologically mortal, meaning that they don't die of old age. According to a 2006 New York Times Science article, for example, Christopher uh, Raxworthy, a herpetologist with the American Museum of Natural History, says that the lungs, livers, and kidneys of a centenarian turtle are virtually indistinguishable from those of its teenage counterpart. He goes on to say turtles don't really die of old age, and if turtles didn't get eaten, crushed by an automobile or fall prey to disease, they might just live indefinitely. Likewise, there are trees on earth that have been around for thousands of years, like some of the great basin bristlecone pines that first sunk their roots into the, the Nevada soil nearly 5,000 years ago. As astonishing as it may sound, it is also true that when life began on Earth in its exclusively cellular form, it was immortal and remained so for more than a billion years. Many single-celled organisms may die as the result of accidental starvation. In fact, the vast majority do, writes cellular biologist William Clark, but there is nothing programmed into them that says they must die. Death did not appear simultaneously with life. This is one of the most important and profound statements in all of biology, and at the very least, it deserves repetition. Death is not inextricably intertwined with the definition of life. In his 1996 book on the origins of death, Clark reminds us that the cells that cells reproduce by dividing and that neither is and both are the original and they don't leave a corpse behind in that process death came later with the advent of more complex multicellular creatures at which time some cells became senescent meaning their ability to replicate normally began deteriorating over time. Today, humans, like most but not all, multicellular creatures on Earth are biologically mortal because our cells are senescent. As we age, they stop working like they're supposed to, leading to numerous age-related health issues, at least one of which will eventually kill us. There are, of course, other reasons animals die die, death by predation, by injury, by inhospitable environments, by disease, all of which can also kill the few immortal creatures that are still around. But even if none of these things kill us, humans will eventually die because of senescence, which is also called biological death. If this weren't the case, if we didn't age, 
It's estimated that the average human lifespan would be around 6,500 years. As Byron Reese writes in his book, The Fourth Age, that's how long it would take for some freak accident to befall you, such as a grand piano falling out of a window and landing on you. <laughs> in such a world, death would be even more of a tragedy, since an accidental death wouldn't just shave 40 years off your life, but 4,000. Today, the average human life is a measly 79 years compared to that. But it's up from 47 years at the start of the 20th century. This increase is due largely to improvements in sanitation and medicine. But it's a fact that nothing has changed biologically in the last century, biotech expert Jim Mellon says. If you take someone out of 1900 and put them in today's environment, they'll live just as long as you do. But in his 2016 book, Juvenescence, the opposite of senescence, Mellon argues that human longevity is in the process of taking a major step forward, a major leap forward. In a nutshell, he says, we believe that it is possible to extend average human life expectancy significantly just by using today's technology to within a decade or so of today's current hard ceiling of about 115 years. That's the oldest we expect anyone to live today. If he's right, that means adding another 35 to 45 years to the average human lifespan within the next 10 years. Nothing's changed to our fundamental biology, Mellon continues, but today we're on the cusp of a major change. The biological engineering of humans, the rearrangement of our atoms and molecules to affect longer lives is with us. There are human trials going on at the moment. This is not science fiction. Shortly before I came to Spokane, almost eight years ago, for example, a 29-year-old member of my congregation in Louisville had been diagnosed with stage 4 melanoma that had spread to his lungs and was told he has only eight months to live. His family, his parents, needless to say, were devastated. Because he was young and otherwise healthy, however, and had nothing to lose, he was okay to undergo a dangerous new experimental treatment in an attempt to stimulate his own immune system to recognize and destroy his cancer. He's still alive today. He has since married as a child and appreciates, deeply appreciates every day of life he has. The same year that he was both told he was both incurable and cured, the FDA approved a vaccine for the treatment of metastatic melanoma based partly upon his success. Since then, in just a few short years, the agency has approved immunotherapy treatments for nearly 20 kinds of cancers. What's remarkable about these cancer treatments, which are still in their infancy, in addition to being able to potentially become the cure for all cancers, is that they fight the disease by altering a patient's own biology. Between 2012, when Jim Mellon wrote Cracking the Code about the biotech revolution, and 2017, when he wrote Juvenescence, he likes to point out that we've not only developed these immunotherapy treatments for cancer, but also artificial intelligence and gene editing, both of which have enormous medical applications, and we've even cured hepatitis C in just the past six years. What happens in the next Six years, Mellon asked. Answering his own question, he predicts that gene editing will eventually inculcate geroprotective genes. That's those genes that are already in and allow some humans, very few humans, to live much longer than most into the general population. 
In the meantime, longevity researchers are focusing on small molecules, stem cells, and organ regeneration. I've recently begun taking a product myself called Basis, designed to promote cellular health by boosting NAD levels, a, com a compound found in all cells that begins to decline as we age, but is also essential to cellular health. Attempting to preempt age-related deterioration and elements with compounds, supplements, and diet in this way is now called biohacking, which it turns out even my spell check knows about. <laughs> Joan Manick, the founder of a company called RestorBio, points out that aging is a biological program that can differ radically in species that are otherwise very similar. The steamer clam lives about 28 years, for example, compared to a very similar clam, the ocean quahog, that lives up to 220 years. A paint painted turtle has an 11-year lifespan compared to a Galapagos land turtle that has a span of 193 years. And the common mouse lives about three years compared to its cousin, the naked mole rat that has a 28-year lifespan. Lifespan, it would seem, is rather arbitrary. What makes the difference, Manick says, has to do with torque one production, a protein complex that's active while eating and inactive while fasting when we're young. But when we grow older, torque one remains active all the time and is associated with the development of age-related health problems. It's not as present in those species, however, that tend to live longer. Inhibiting it, according to RestorBio, has been observed to prolong lifespan, enhance immune function, ameliorate heart failure, enhance memory and mobility, decrease body fat, and delay the onset of aging-related diseases in multiple animal studies. Mannix says her company is initially working to impact respiratory infections, which are a leading cause of death in seniors. During phase two trials involving 900 patients, they've already achieved a 40% reduction in respiratory infections. Samumed is another company specializing in regenerative medicine by creating treatments that make use of what is called the WNT pathway, W-N-T, a protein that signals the regenerative properties of cells in all creatures. They are abundant, once again, when we're young, but not so much as we age, which is why bones heal easier, our joints don't go bad, and we don't go bald when we're kids. <laughs> Samumed has already had success growing new cartilage in bad knees with a single injection of the Wnt protein. This treatment is now in phase three clinical trials. By the way, phase one, two, and three are all human trials. It's just a matter of how much you're able to expose humans to, which means the next step will be for it to be approved by the FDA, which may happen uh, by the end of this year, and end the need for evasive joint replacement surgeries. When overactive, it makes sense, and it's true, that the Wnt pathway can also cause cancer by overproducing cells. So Samumed has developed a treatment to also inhibit Wnt production, which is currently in phase one trials. They were allowed to thoroughly treat a 30-year-old 30 30 year woman with it under the Compassionate Use Act because she had terminal pancreatic cancer, was down to 70 pounds, and was sent home to die. After a year of treatment, her cancer is gone. She weighs 130 pounds again, is, is athletic, and is living a normal life. Samumet also has an Alzheimer's treatment in phase one trials. It was given to a 
80-year-old woman, also under compassionate use, who was bedridden, non-responsive, and unable to walk, eat, talk, or recognize her family. Within three months of treatment, she can do all these things again. Samumed has six treatments for other age-related conditions currently in phase one human trials, as well as treatments for osteoarthritis, as mentioned, and male pattern baldness in phase three. So uh, there's hope, guys. Cellularity Inc. is a medical company specializing in stem cell research and regenerative treatments with it. The company recognizes stem cells which easily replenish whatever cells our bodies need when we're young exponentially decline as we age, leading to cardiovascular, pulmonary, cognitive, and cancer diseases that 80% of people over 65 have at least one of. In their research, animals that have had their stem cells replaced live 40% longer than their counterparts. Cellularity is using placental stem cells, because how many of us saved our stem cells, right? So they're using placental stem cells, which is kind of like receiving stem cells from a universal donor. Don't have to worry about rejecting it, right? There's a, uh, the, pl the placental shield allows uh, a fetus not to reject its mother's body and its mother not to reject the infant's body. So placenta is a good, so good resource for this. Uh, but they're using this to develop treatments that will actually reverse the aging process and keep us active and healthy no matter how old we are. That's the goal. I'll mention one other company before moving on. Alleviant is developing treatments based upon studies showing animals transfused with blood of young animals experience regeneration across many tissues and organs. And the opposite is also proven to be true, that young animals, when transfused with the blood of older animals, experience accelerated aging. This is so, the company says, because of a molecule known as GDF-11 or growth differentiation factor 11, which again becomes scarce as our cells undergo senescence. GDF-11 supplementation accelerates skeletal muscle repair, improves exercise capacity, improves brain function and cerebral blood flow, and improves metabolism. In 2014, not too long ago, Science Magazine named Alevian's findings one of the top 10 scientific breakthroughs of the year. And just two years later, a similar drug uh, produced by another company, which actually eliminates senescent cells in our bodies, was named the breakthrough of the year. So why talk about these breakthroughs during a church service on Sunday morning? Well, firstly, because this isn't just any Sunday morning church service. This is a Unitarian Universalist service where anything goes. <laughs> That's actually not so. But ours is a religion that has long valued science as a source of truth and reason and inspiration. As the bylaws of this very congregation stated in 1888, the authority for its belief is reason, the method of findings, its belief is scientific, its aim is to crush superstition and establish the facts of religion. Today, as a result of merging with universalism's anything goes attitude, some may think talking about extending our lives isn't very spiritual or goes against nature. But I'd argue such opinions have no bearing on the matter since it is already upon us and happening. Remember, I'm the preacher who thinks church is about dealing with reality, not escaping it. 
On the other hand, what can be more spiritual than the possibility of living longer, healthier lives? And what's more natural than the desire of every creature to survive? There's a scene in the 1985 Ron Howard film, Cocoon, about a group of people in a retirement community who discover a swimming pool with re rejuvenating powers. Toward the end of the film, one of the aliens responsible for the technology invites some of them to leave Earth with him and go where they won't ever have to worry about dying or aging again. You would be students, of course, the alien says, but you'd also be teachers. And the new civilizations you would be traveling to would be like unlike anything you've ever seen before. But I promise you, you will all lead productive lives. Forever, Ben Luckett, played indelibly by Wilford Brimley, asked, We don't know what forever is, the alien replies. Ben then turns to marry his spouse, who seems reluctant. So you think it's like Bernie said, we're cheating nature, he asks. Yes, Mary says. Well, I'll tell you. With the way nature's been cheating us, I don't mind cheating her a little. <laughs> I suspect that there are those among us who are young at heart, young souls trapped in aging bodies, who can relate. And given the opportunity to feel better and be as active as they'd like, would also say yes to what currently sounds like alien technology. But however one might respond, it's a question we all must begin thinking about because these advances in science and medicine, again, are already upon us and with them, many ethical and social ramifications. Currently, the fastest growing demographic anywhere on Earth is 65-year-olds, 80% of whom, again, have at least one age-related illness. And with the global population decline, you don't, if you haven't heard about that, the global human population is declining causing most countries to be below the necessary replacement birth rates. There are going to be fewer young people to help replenish the financial and employment base needed to care for a society that is dominated by elders. One solution is to dismiss anti-aging technologies as unnatural and selfish and condemn everyone to die around a normal age which was around 30 years until the 18th century, 47 in 1900 and almost 80 today. How would we feel today if 100 years ago our society had said, sorry, sanitation, antibiotics, vaccinations just aren't natural. You'll just have to die before you're 50. It seems a better, more humane, and far more likely solution to reverse the impacts of aging, eliminating rising elder care costs in the process. According to a 60 Minutes story about a decade ago now, Medicare annually pays more to doctors and hospitals in the last two months of a patient's lives than the entire budget for the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Education combined. More than 125 billion Medicare dollars, about a quarter of its annual budget goes to 5% of its recipients during the last year of their life. Imagine what we could do with that money if it weren't being spent on age-related illnesses. And wonder what we'll do if such a program runs out of money because it's overwhelmed by the number of people who need it and no longer has enough young people working to help replenish it. 
If we can cure these illnesses or prevent them from ever happening to begin with, we should. Because as Wilfred Brimley also said, it's the right thing to do. Living longer and healthier also requires us to think more deeply about our moral obligations to younger people. How do we continue to live long, healthy, productive lives without robbing them of the opportunities to do the same? If older folks aren't retiring, where will they find jobs? And if we're still healthy enough to work but don't, what will we do with our time? What will society look like when people are active for more than a century? and probably much longer as technologies continue to exponentially improve. More importantly, what do we want it to look like? What do we want our future to look like? If we're planning to re-engineer our biology, let's simultaneously plan to re-engineer our society so that they work together. Let's not just wait and see what happens. The times we're living in are as exciting as they are uncertain, filled with as many problems as they are possibilities, and as much reason for dread as there is for hope. That the future remains uncertain is a truth that probably never will change, but humanity is also on the cusp of a transformation once imagined only in science fiction. As a placard I read not long ago stated, people have no idea how fast things are changing. Spread the gospel. Increasingly, I feel that it is my job as a minister to help us all adjust to living in a world of exponential change. If things are changing so fast, we can't keep up with them. It's hard to adapt. There's no wonder anxiety is the fastest growing disorder among young people. But if we can relax a little as we slip down the rabbit hole, who knows what wonders we might experience? Who knows what beauty might break free from the cocoon that has encrusted our species for too long? As far as we know, Life is one of the rarest occurrences in the universe, and on a cosmic scale, one that is all too brief. I hope more of us, eventually all of us, can enjoy this rare gift to its fullest for as long as possible. Thank you. Please rise for our closing hymn, number 345, With Joy We Claim the Growing Light. <clears throat> it's a short one, so I'll have Michalina play it all the way through.
Make us aware of the truth and beauty around us, the truth and beauty within us, and the truth and beauty we can transform into the world. Amen. Blessed be. Salam alaikum and shalom.